Hello, everyone. Hey. I can't see people are coming in. Welcome to Let's Talk Vaccines. Can you all see people as they come in? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I just see private chat. Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started here in about a minute. Brianna, is there a way I can see people coming in? No, but you will see the comments. Okay. 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 Well, we will go ahead and get started just in the name of punctuality. My name is Jessica Manning. I am one of the members of Now Medic team. Um, our other members are Deborah Gray, uh, Candace Barr, Katrina Fordham Burris, Jackie McIntyre, and our guest, um, fabulous speaker, Nicole Swanner, also known as Doc Swanner. Um, we are in the Now Medic team. If anybody is interested um, in joining the Now Medic team, I'll go ahead and make a shameless plug here. Um, feel free to reach out to us after this, or you're welcome to to email us through our email, which will be posted later on um, if anyone has questions. Um, but going forward, I'll go ahead and introduce our special guest today. Um, it's Her name is Nicole Swanner. She is voted one of 10 best doctors in North Carolina. Doc Swanner is a family physician, a six-time best-selling author, blogger, speaker, wife, and mother in Durham. She is also affectionately known as the Superwoman Complex Expert and has written two best-selling books on the topic, which has now evolved into the No Superwoman Lifestyle brand with merchandise and events. Um, additionally, with her company, Swanner Publishing Company, she helps writers become best-selling authors and entrepreneurs from start to finish. Um, she loves taking care of her family as a whole with interest in minority health, women's health, um, self-care, and female entrepreneurship. She attended Duke University and went to medical school at the Medical School, Medical University of South Carolina. She's lived in the Triangle Durham since uh, finishing residency at UNC Chapel Hill and continues teaching as an adjunct associate professor with the family medicine department. Um, when she's not treating patients at Durham Family Medicine, she's spending time with her family, speaking nationally, freelancing for WebMD and the Birdie Beauty brand and teaching others to self-publish. She has become one of the nation's experts on self-care, imposter syndrome, physician burnout, and well-being. So she's fabulous amongst many things. Um, if We'll have her contact information later as well. Um, and so first we wanted to start with Jackie. She's gonna give us a little background um, on research and just vaccines in general. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie. Sorry, I was not there or muted there. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of information on vaccines and what they are. Um, and this is mostly from the CDC um, fact page. Um, vaccines basically contain the same germs that cause disease, such as the measles vaccine contains measles virus and that sort of thing. They are either killed or weakened to the point that they don't make you sick. And some vaccines only contain part of the disease, of the disease germ. Um, the point is for the va vaccine to stimulate your immune system to produce antibodies, um, exactly like it would if you were exposed to the disease itself. For instance, the chickenpox vaccine um, kind of gives you the same antibodies that it would if you'd actually been exposed to chickenpox by a you know, classmate or whatnot. Um, after getting vaccinated, you develop immunity to that disease 
without having to get the disease first. So that is the benefit of the vaccine. Um, and this is what makes vaccines such powerful medicine. Unlike most medications, which treat or cure diseases, vaccines prevent them. So that is why we're talking about the COVID vaccine today, um, so that we can help people prevent getting the COVID um, infection. And so uh, a lot of people have these concerns about the fact that it was um, it was approved before it was officially FDA approved. Um, and just some information on how that works as far as um, the uh, early release of vaccinations. The whole point of the FDA is to make sure that these drugs or vaccines are safe uh, and that they cause more benefit than harm. And so for it to be an early release, it doesn't mean that it didn't go through any kind of testing. It just means that the need for the vaccine outweighed the completion of the four or five phases that a drug or vaccine typically will go through before it's um, approved for, you know, everyone in the population. So, um, you know, we want to kind of not necessarily tell you you should get it, but we want to relate to kind of mitigate that fear of it being an early release vaccine versus something that's gone through all the phases. It has been found to be beneficial um, even at this point, even though it didn't go all the way to phase four and it may be finished phase two or whatnot. So that's kind of why we're here today to answer any questions for anybody who might have them. So, Thank you so much, Jackie. And just for everyone, we're going to have a, a point um, for question and answer directly with Dr. Swiner after um, sort of the presentation part of this. And so if you would, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat if you have them there or um, you can have access to our email address that you can send them if your questions don't get answered um, while we're on the live and we can get them answered for you um, shortly after. So if you would, just save your questions for then. Um, so the next part of our um, vaccine talk is going to be a Q&A with Dr. Swider and one of our members, Katrina. Good afternoon, everyone, and hello, Doc Swiner. Thank you so much for joining us for this very essential, vital topic. Um, we're talking about the COVID vaccine. So I was very privileged to have the opportunity to work with you one-on-one -on -one, um, in kind of your day-to-day -day working at your uh, private practice, Durham Family Medicine, and actually had the opportunity to see firsthand um, some of the different environments that you were placed in and working with patients, um, your COVID clinic, things of that nature. So I just kind of want to drive the conversation um, with that as a foundational piece. And if you could, um, just if you could tell our audience a little bit about the three vaccines, um, a lot of questions are around the differences between the three. So if we could just kind of start there. I think that'd be a great starting point. Absolutely. Uh, hello now, church family. I'm so happy to be here. So happy to see you guys virtually and hopefully soon in person. Uh, and congratulations to my wonderful interviewer, Dr. Katrina Burris, who just walked the stage and got her letters behind her name. Yes, ma'am. More letters, more letters. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Katrina, for that um, that intro and Miss Jessica and Deborah and Jackie and Candace and everybody for inviting me on. Pastor Nate uh, and and First Lady Tequila. So, um, yes. Yeah, so as mentioned, I am a family physician and I work and co-own Durham Family Medicine, which is a private practice in Durham, and we do full spectrum family medicine. So we take care of the whole family from start to finish, and we have you know been taxed with working our way through this crazy pandemic. You know, trying to figure out not only how to protect ourselves and our families from catching COVID, but how to protect our patients and treat them and, and you know, cure and, you know, help to, to spread the, the good word of the information that we get on a daily, which seems to change every day um, about COVID and, and the vaccines and the treatments, et cetera. So it's been a, a crazy year. It's been a challenging year, but God has kept us. Thank, thank the Lord. And we've been safe and healthy in my household. And, and so I'm, I'm trying my best to get the word out to the world and our community about how to protect ourselves and, and move past uh, this pandemic even more. So um, yeah, so Katrina was able to come during, you know, right at the end of her um, doctoral program to come and just be with us and see how we've been operating, particularly during the pandemic and trying to navigate the differences and the changes in protocol, you know, how to keep our staff safe, 
with mask protocol and checking temperatures and all these things. But I was very, very, very excited when the vaccines hit the scene. Um, and I don't know, you know, if you happen to, to follow me on, on social media, I've been kind of, I've been very open and honest and transparent about my own journey as just a, a you know, a person living through this pandemic and actually tested positive myself in December um, for COVID. And thank the Lord, I was asymptomatic, no problems. We think it's, it's likely a false positive, meaning, you know, labs can be falsely positive and falsely negative. And so because of that, I was even more excited to hear that the vaccines were available. I think that very same week, the vaccine uh, was first given to uh, a black nurse in New York. She was the first person here or first person in America to get it. So that was exciting watching that, but it, it also made me a little nervous, right? So as Ms. Jackie mentioned, yeah, it felt like it was fast, right? So we had you know, this novel virus, meaning the first of its type, uh, although coronavirus has been here forever. So coronavirus, the actual species or family of viruses has existed forever, but the 19, that one was brand new. Popped up in March or you know February of 2020, and then less than a year later, we have a vaccine to treat it, which sounds great, but clearly, you know, a lot of folks have some hesitancy. So a lot of my job this last year has been learning about it myself because I had questions. So doing the research, talking to the people that developed them, talking to my friends and colleagues in research, and then trying to translate and educate, um, particularly our marginalized populations, our black and brown folks, on the importance of protecting ourselves because we're dying at three times the rate than the general population from this disease. So even more important for me to be able to explain the differences of all the, the vaccines. Um, so that's my long background um, as to how we got to this point here. But I'm excited about the opportunities we have now to get the vaccines. I'm excited that almost everyone has access to it because that was also an issue in the beginning is how we're gonna get these vaccines out to people that really need them. But there's almost, there's almost no excuse right now to not have the vaccine if you want it because thankfully we have it you know, available in multiple places. The big three as Dr. Katrina referred to are the Pfizer, uh, Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the controversial Johnson & Johnson <laughs> vaccine which was removed for a minute and then it came back um, recently. So we've had a lot of heated debates about all the vaccines, especially President Johnson lately. So, um, you know, I don't know, we can go a lot of different ways with talking about the differences and the pros and cons, but I don't know. Did, did you have any specific ways you want to go about it, Dr. Katrina? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of um, discussion around the two shot dose versus the one shot dose. Can you provide us a little bit of insight about maybe some of the major differences and similarities between each? Absolutely. So Pfizer and Moderna were the ones that came out first. They are both mRNA. You know, you may have heard of DNA. RNA is similar to that. And mRNA is the message RNA um, kind of, you know, message system that, that Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are made of. They are the two doses. So Pfizer, you get uh, one, and then in three weeks, you get your second dose. And then Moderna, you get one, and then in four weeks, you get your second dose. And they are made the same way. Johnson & Johnson is the one dose. And I know a lot of my folks are waiting for that, you know, that one hit a quitta or that one shot deal, you know, one shot and I'm done because, you know, needle phobia, or they're just like, I just want to you know, have to deal with this one time. Um, but it's made differently. It's actually made from particles of the viral, like the covering of the virus, so not the actual virus itself, mm. but um, pieces or particles of the virus that the body then recognizes as foreign, and then it produces the antibody response. So it is different than Pfizer and Moderna. It also is just one dose. The biggest difference, other than the way that they're made um, and how frequently you get them, is Johnson Johnson is less effective, right? So mm -hmm. Pfizer and Moderna, two doses, mRNA. Neither of these, by the way, have anything to do with the actual virus itself. So neither, none of these contain the actual virus. That's a big question I get from patients too, is that are, am I actually getting COVID? No, you're not. It's, it's a message to the body to create antibodies against the virus because they sort of look like what the virus looks like. But the other major difference and why I 
I'm not a huge fan. There are a lot of reasons I'm not a huge fan of Johnson & Johnson right now, but um, it's less effective. Pfizer and Moderna or are at least 95 to 97% effective against you catching COVID-19, whereas Johnson & Johnson is like in the mid-70s. Wow. So those are the, the big three differences. Wow. So that's really good information to know because I didn't necessarily know that they were um, made up differently. Um, yeah the actual makeup of them, which leads me uh, to my next question. So a lot of people in the community are concerned kind of about the preparation leading up to getting the vaccine. Um, there are a lot of you know rumors and different people have side effects about, oh, I was sick, I was tired, I had a headache, my body was aching. Um, can you provide our audience with maybe some tips or resources as they prepare if they're interested in getting their very first shot? Yeah. So as, as uh, Ms. Jackie mentioned, you know, she was very, uh, she did a great job on describing how it seemed like things got, things happened so quickly. It wasn't that steps were skipped in developing these vaccines. It's just that we actually had a lot more resources, a lot more hands on deck, a lot more money to be able to use to do the research. And we knew how emergent the situation was. I mean, people were dying. So we knew we had to get the job done. Um, it wasn't that we skipped phase one, phase two, and all of that. We were just, imagine, you know, there are multiple different pharmaceutical companies working on multiple drugs and vaccines at one time. When COVID hit, they said, okay, everybody focus here, this one thing. So more people were able to work on it. It took shorter the amount of time because they were able to do faster work. Right. Um, so just, just to back up what Sister Jackie said, that no steps were skipped, none, Okay. Now we got emergent, you know, we got the emergent approval to use it again because people are dying. It's actually, uh, you know, unethical to have something that you know will help someone and people are dying and you're not using it. Right. That's unethical. So for the FDA to say, you know what, we have great evidence, great benefits. Let's go ahead and put this on the market is actually a great thing. Um, it's also really great that the FDA has been very, very heavily involved in watching for the side effect the side effects which is proven uh by jay being snatched off the market right so we got all these negative reports about uh johnson and johnson and astrazeneca which actually hasn't even hit the american market in europe they're watching astrazeneca and didn't like what was happening so they took it off the market mm -hmm. so the fda is watching you know we're just not out here willy-nilly just putting you know putting shots in people it's highly regulated. And so that should give you some reassurance. Um, and that should give you a little bit of comfort that these aren't just, you know, we're not experimenting, right? We have proof that these are helpful. Um, and I may have gotten off on a tangent. Did I ask you, answer your question? <laughs> you, you did. So um, for, for people in our network or our communities that are wanting to get the vaccine, but have fears about the side effects, are there any tips that you can provide to them to maybe put them at ease? Like, for example, you know, hey, before you go get your first one, take a Tylenol or aspirin or whatever an hour before you go. Maybe just some tips to kind of ease their mind about the potential side effects that they might experience. Because everybody doesn't get that, right? Some, right. People do, some people don't. Which is interesting. So everybody's different. Everybody's immune system is different. Everyone's immune response is different. Uh, you know, everyone's health history and the medications that we're on are different. So all of that has to do with how you will uh, respond to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I tend to think if you have some side effects, that means you got the real thing. You got some stuff, right? Because I had a, there's been some reports about people, unfortunately, showing up and getting saline, right? Or just water, essentially, mm -hmm. injected and not getting the real thing. So I tend to think if you got some side effects, that means you really got a good immune response and you know what's there. But you're right. Not everybody will have the uh, the side effects, but side effects are side effects, meaning it's not because your body isn't tolerating the thing. It's your body is dealing with it. It's producing antibodies and your body is getting used to it. So you can pretty much, you know, assume that you're going to feel something. Right. So me, for instance, I got uh, Pfizer and that's just the one that I happen to, you know, I, in my medical association, that's just the one that happened to be supplied to us. In our practice, we have Moderna, um, but either one is fine. So got Pfizer. There's a, a you know controversy as to whether you should take medicines prior to getting your shot. Mm -hmm. Really like ibuprofen, there's some, some thought that it may decrease your immune response. So I ended up taking a little bit of Tylenol just cause you know, I didn't want to hurt that much in my arms. Mm -hmm. so a little bit of Tylenol before I went first time, first dose. 
went, got yeah. shot, had a little bit of soreness, you know, similar to when I get a tetanus shot. And by the next day and the day after, I was great. Second dose, I felt it. So second time, ended up not doing Tylenol before, because again, I didn't want to blunt the uh, immune response. I wanted to really, really feel it, really get those antibodies. But when I got home that night, I went ahead and took some Tylenol. So I didn't take Tylenol before, but I took it after. And then before I went to bed, I took ibuprofen. This is after getting the shot, not before. Felt good that night, was good. But the day after, for about six hours, it hit me. <laughs> so I was in front of the fireplace and like with a blanket, I had chills, I had a little bit of headache. Um, not so much the fatigue, uh, but I had headache, chills, and um, what else? And my arm was sore, you know? And so I was laughing and joking with my kids who were kind of watching me like, what is happening? I was telling them I was turning into a superhero. Because my antibodies were, you know, they were building up. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> I turned into Superwoman. They were like, okay, okay, we, we, we get it. But by the end of the evening, I was fine. No problem. So I, to, to be safe, just assume you're probably going to feel something, particularly that next day. Mm -hmm. Have your Tylenol and ibuprofen on hand, lots of fluids. <clears throat> I know a lot of employees are giving their, um, a lot of employers are giving their employees the day after off just to right. let you rest. Mm -hmm. which is smart too. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll recover. You'll be all right. So speaking about the children, um, we, I saw a message pop up in the chat. So, you know, there's a lot of news coverage right now about the vaccine being made available to the younger population. Yeah. What is your buy-in and your thoughts about that? I'm excited. I'm <laughs> excited because, well, so my kids aren't the, of the age yet. Mm -hmm. However, if they were above age 12, you know, so it's between ages, ages 12 and 17, that Pfizer, has now been approved. I just saw a report today that Moderna's next. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited, particularly as I think about my kids going back to school. Right. Because uh, we kept them virtual the entire year, even when they decided to do hybrid and take some of the kids back. Um, we decided to keep them here, let people get those shots, let those antibodies get in, let the numbers decrease. Um, so the more of their fellow students and the classmates can get the shot, the better, because then that protects my kids until they can get the shot. Right. right? So I'm excited about it. I have a number of patients that have been able, um, teenagers and adolescents that have been able to get it. Um, and they felt fine. I've, I've heard zero bad reports, oh, no right. negative effects or side effects. Um, so I'm really excited that our kids are able to go ahead and get it. Okay. Um, that's great, great information. Um, and I think one of the last questions um, I'd like to pose to you, Dr. Sliner, um, with the governor kind of raising a lot of the mandates, right, the mask mandates, you know, there's a lot of kind of back and forth. Some people, I'm tired of masks, I'm tired of masks. Now they don't have to wear the mask. Now they're complaining about not having to wear the mask. Um, so what are your thoughts about vaccinated individuals um, in different spaces, whether it be at church, because, you know, a lot of us are returning back to services in person. Um, a lot of the community have concerns about that. Um, what is your buy-in on that topic? So I am, again, this is all good news. So that means that we're all moving in the right direction. You know, the wouldn't be uh, dropping and lowering the requirements if it were not for really good numbers, right? So numbers looking better, deaths are decreasing, hospitalizations are decreasing, and the amount of people getting their shots is increasing. That's all good news. Mm -hmm. So happy that the governor is ready to start, you know, loosening those um, restrictions, but Still a little nervous that, you know, folks that are not able to get vaccinated, like some folks that, um, like, you know, younger than age 12 or haven't had access to it or have been sick and can't get the shot yet. I'm nervous for them because not necessarily for vaccinated people to go maskless, but for some unvaccinated people who have just are just rushing to it, you know, rushing to snatch that mask off and not be as safe as we once were. I'm nervous for people who are unvaccinated to get it from other unvaccinated people. Mm -hmm. um, however, for vaccinated people that have been fully vaccinated, meaning you're two weeks after your second dose or two weeks after your first dose, if you happen to have the Johnson & Johnson, I think it's okay to go without your mask in the presence of other vaccinated people, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing, um, which, you know, it's not the gospel, but it, it, I feel safe. I'm still wearing my mask. <laughs> so when I go to the grocery store, I'm even if I'm taking a quick walk outside, yes, I, I'm one of those crazy people still with their mask on. I don't wear it in the car. That's my husband. 
Don't tell him I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him I told you. He's um, watching, you know. Huh? What? He's watching. He probably is. He um, is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, too. So, you know what? Disclaimer. Let people do what they feel comfortable with, right? We don't have to judge people. If they want to keep their masks on from here on out, so be it. So be it. So I'm going to, let's not judge each other. Let's not mask shame each other. I definitely have heard of people being like inside a store or at a, a restaurant where they had their masks on and didn't, maybe they didn't necessarily have to have it on. But an, uh, another maskless person would come and say, well, you know, we don't have to wear a mask. You can take it off. Let people do what they want to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let them do. But as for me, I am going to continue wearing my mask when I'm inside, definitely inside the clinic, although the majority of my staff and patients are vaccinated, inside a restaurant until it's time to eat. If I can't eat outside, if I'm walking in a grocery store, you know, I'm also role modeling it for my kids because they will still have to wear masks. You know, they can't get the vaccine yet. So not only am I trying to protect them, because even though you're vaccinated, you can still catch COVID and transmit it to someone else, even though you may be okay, even if you catch COVID, you can still give it to somebody else. So I still have two young kids I gotta look out for. I still have patients I have to look out for. So I will still be wearing my mask. If you are unvaccinated, please continue wearing your mask everywhere and get the shot. And that was um, a great point that you put up too. Um, I know we need to move on, however, um, that was another question that, you know, has been kind of swirling around. Like, if you have the vaccine, can you still catch COVID? And kind of what should you expect if you do catch it and you have the vaccine? Can you just quickly kind of cover that? And then, you know, I'm going to go and turn it back over to yeah. Ms. Jessica. Yes. So you can still catch COVID-19 if you've gotten your vaccine. There's still a 3 to 5% chance, you know, with Pfizer mm -hmm. and Moderna of still catching COVID-19. There's even greater percentage chance with uh, Johnson & Johnson, because remember they, it only covers you like 75 to 78%. Wow. So it's still a 20 something percent chance that you could still catch COVID. Um, the, the hope is though, is if you do catch it, hopefully you will be asymptomatic, right? You won't have any symptoms, or you'll have a very, very mild case like a cold or a flu, right? The shots, Pfizer and Moderna, 100% will cover you from having severe disease from COVID-19 hospitalization or dying, 100%. Who wouldn't want 100% protection from that, right? Right. So despite what side effects you have, those big three, well, that was the thing that really made the decision for me. But yes, you can still catch it. Um, and so the even bigger concern is you can still catch it. And even though you feel fine because you're vaccinated, you could go and visit your grandmother who's on chemo, who can't get the vaccine for some reason now, and you can transmit it to her and she can have severe disease or to your child that can't be unvaccinated because they're not of age. So it's still very serious. Um, you still have to be very careful and um, really, you know, be in control of your environment. You know, I like to joke that, you know, we outside and we're out in the street, but I try to move in my bubble. So I'm vaccinated, my husband's vaccinated, our, you know, family, our Blexlance crew, Dr. Katrina, we are vaccinated. So we try to move as a unit when we go outside to kind of create a bubble. So you know, be very choosy about where you are and who you're around. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Swanner, for taking the time to talk with me today and answer some burning questions. I do see that there are more coming up in the chat, which we'll have opportunity to kind of address those later. But for right now, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jess. Thank you, guys. And thank you again, Dr. Swanner and Dr. Katrina, as you have graduated. Congratulations again. Um, that was very, very helpful and very, very insightful. And I hope um, a lot of people gain some knowledge um, from those answers. So next, the team, um, the med team is going to talk about their specific interactions with the vaccine. We've all been vaccinated. And so we'll just kind of go around and, it, it, and yeah, <laughs> thumbs up for all of us. We'll go around and just kind of give our experience. Um, I, I'll go ahead and start. So again, I'm Jessica Manning. I'm a nurse at UNC Chapel Hill. I work with heart failure patients. And um, I've been vaccinated since the end of January. Um, I didn't actually have the big immune response that a lot of people have been having. And I was kind of bummed out about it, to be honest. It sounds weird um, because I was thinking, you know, if I feel something, that means my body sees it. It's reacting. It's saying, hey, you don't belong here. So I thought I, thought I was going to be good to go. However, my arm did hurt. My arm hurt pretty bad both times, both first dose and second dose. But I didn't have any other um, reactions. Um, 
my husband has now been vaccinated and he's had um, the same sort of experience. And so we both uh, have, haven't had the big immune response. We've had pretty severe arm pain, um, but didn't really require any um, medication for that. So that was good. But um, Ms. Deborah, would you like to go next and share your experience with the vaccine? Okay, I'm a LPN at the VA hospital. I got my vaccine in December. Uh, at first, I wasn't going to get it. And then the Holy Spirit says, you need to get it. So I got my vaccine, didn't have any side effects, arm wasn't sore. I actually, I am a vaccinator champion. So the same day I got my vaccine, I went downstairs and gave vaccines the rest of the day to some of the employees. Uh, since then, I have signed up all my children, didn't ask them if they wanted it, made, uh, got them scheduled at Walgreens, sent them the text and say, you go and get your vaccine. The kicker was my youngest one, which is a millennial, took a while for him to get his. So the day that he finally got it, he got Johnson and Johnson. And then the next day they uh, stopped it. But it was good. Looks like we lost Jessica temporarily. Um, Dr. Katrina, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Katrina Burris. Um, I'm a medical lab director for Wake County. I was vaccinated a couple months ago now. Um, my husband is also vaccinated. We have small babies, seven and two, so they don't fall in the category to get vaccinated quite yet. Um, but my experience was very mild. Um, I did have some slight side effects after um, my second shot, but it wasn't anything that, you know, I could really say was bad. I was just really, really tired. Um, I just felt like I had not had sleep for an extended period of time. But other than that, my experience was good. Um, my husband also had a very pleasant experience. Um, having worked in the medical field and also um, I have a little person that's joining us. <laughs> <laughs> um, having worked in the medical field and especially in the field of public health, I felt that it was very essential for um, me to get the vaccine because of my exposure, not only to my family, but also to our patients. So um, that was pretty much my driving force behind getting vaccinated. Um, I want to keep my little people safe. I want to keep my patients safe. And I want to stay safe too. Thank you guys, Miss Jackie. Uh, yes, my name is Jackie McIntyre. Like I said, I am a nurse at Duke. I work in the um, adult oncology field. And so I originally was going to wait and see kind of how a lot of my other black, you know, medical field um, cohorts were tolerating the vaccine before I did it. But I think Duke started vaccinating employees in early December. I finally relented and went on and got my first shot at the end of December, got my second one, the Martin Luther King uh, weekend, because I'd be off on Monday, so I didn't have to take any time off. Um, but I actually only, the sore arm probably was the, I guess if you could say the worst um, side effect that I had. Um, maybe a little mild headache and a little just kind of a yuck feeling the first shot, second shot, no side effects whatsoever outside of my sore arm. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it was very, I won't say pleasant, but, you know, it wasn't something that I, you know, I haven't worked in research. I was like, you know what, Jackie, you got to be an example. So I did <laughs> go ahead and, and do that and, uh, and make sure that, you know, my family members and that sort of thing uh, knew what, what to expect and the things that, you know, they needed to know. So it was it was a decent experience and I'm glad I did it. Good. And last but not least, Candace. Hello, I'm Candace. I'm a medical student at UNC at Chapel Hill. Okay. <laughs> um, and I've been vaccinated since February of this year. My husband is vaccinated as well. With my experience, I had arm pain, chills, and I just didn't feel right. But it was only for like a couple of hours and I slept it off and it was okay. Um, 
part of the reason why I got the vaccine is I was going into clinical settings now, transitioning, and I was going to be around pediatric patients who aren't covered, who can't get the vaccine. So I felt like it was my duty to get the vaccine. Another apprehension was I have allergies and I didn't know how I would respond to the vaccine. But once I got there, the process was seamless. They asked me if I had allergies and I told them my allergies and it didn't have anything that would react with the vaccine. And I was comforted that I was able to wait for 30 minutes and they could keep an eye on me mm -hmm. after every shot. So that was my experience with the vaccine. And I encourage all of you all to go get vaccinated. If not for yourself, just do it for your community. Thank you, Candace, and thank you guys. So lastly, we're just gonna open it up to questions. If you know, people have questions, I see in the chats, um, for some reason my chat is not showing the question. So Jackie, if you can see the questions, would you mind um, reading out some questions so Dr. Swanner can answer them? Okay, so um, the main one is the one that just popped up because I think she's posted it twice now just to make sure okay. um, about her bad food allergies and whether or not she said her doctor recommended the Johnson and Johnson shot, but she wants to take the Pfizer and she's going tomorrow. Any recommendations for people with food allergies? Yes. Um, uh oh, I'm echoing. Can you hear me okay? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so as I said, I'm not a big fan of Johnson & Johnson, so I'm glad that you're already signed up to get Pfizer. And from a food allergy perspective, I don't think there's any reason that you should have any other or any more concern than, you know, if you were to get the flu shot. Actually, I take that back. You actually may have more concern for the flu shot because there are people that like the food allergies that can't tolerate the flu, shot, the flu shot. But no, there's no contraindication. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to tolerate the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and, you know, what I put, my husband has really bad, like, you know, dust pollen, tree, fruit allergies, and he was a little bit nervous, too. But what I told him was just to take some Benadryl with him um, and tell the nurse, tell whomever that the person is uh, administering the vaccine about your allergies. And just like um, med student Candace said, just let them know and they can observe you for a little bit longer than the usual 15 minutes. Um, and then, you know, if you have any problems or concerns, call your doctor the next day. But Go ahead and get the Pfizer. I think you'll be all right. Yeah. I see a question from Maria Whitehead. Do you want me to go ahead and answer, Jessica? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah. So just asking about side effects later down the road from vaccine or health complications. I don't think so. Uh, the literature has not shown that to be the case. You know, I know there's been some concerns about uh, have you know issues with fertility and other types of things, but there's nothing in the literature from the research that says anything related to that. So no, I don't anticipate um, that there will be long-term side effects or long-term health complications from the vaccine. Clearly they're still being followed and studied, so we'll see, but as of right now, I'm, I'm not concerned. All right, Myra Tim is asking about people with autoimmune disease, she gets infusion treatments. That's what some hospitals use to treat COVID patients, correct. Um, so I've had a number of autoimmune patients that have received the vaccine and have done very well, very well. Um, actually, because because of your autoimmune disease, you're actually at higher risk. So I would put you even higher on the list to get the vaccine sooner rather than later. So as long as you're talking to your physician and telling the person that's giving you the shot about your history, uh, then I think you'll be you'll be fine. I would much rather put uh, my eggs in the you getting the vaccine basket than us risking you catching COVID basket and having to deal with those problems as an autoimmune patient. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. Let me see if there's any more questions here. And I'm swiping through the Facebook um, broadcast too. Okay. People are saying, I'm still wearing my mask. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Do it. Do it. Yeah. My husband says she's putting my business in the street. <laughs> he heard me. Oh, there he is. He heard me talking to me. That's funny. Any other questions, folks? I want to make it as, as easy and as I want you to be as educated as possible, and I want you to actually hear it from the horse's mouth. I don't want you getting your stuff from social media and from the media. I want you to talk to people that have been doing this for this past year and really have uh, you know, followed the research. 
Okay. So I, I actually have a question. Um, so what would you say to the um, African-American community earlier in our talk, you talked about kind of the, the rates of death and different things amongst the African-American community. <clears throat> Just in, you know, being in conversation, a lot of the African-American community have a lot of fears because of historical references, right? Like the Tuskegee experiment, things of that nature. So what would you say to that population to give them a little bit more security when it comes to getting the vaccine? Absolutely. So we definitely have had these conversations in practice as well. You know, I have a, a large um, population of African-American and Latino folks in my clinic. So we have these conversations daily. So, yes, there has unfortunately been a lot of horrible things in history that has happened between the medical community and black and brown marginalized populations. Um, the difference with this time or what's happening now with COVID and the vaccines is the amount of op information we have access to. So with Tuskegee and with other issues that might have happened in the past, a lot of that information was hidden. It was kept secret. Mm -hmm. We were used as guinea pigs without our knowledge. We were experimented on without our consent. This situation is different. Thankfully, we have all, all of the information is available to us. Um, we know what's happening. We see it on the news. We see it on social media. We have friends and family that have dealt with it that are working on the research side and are helping to develop these vaccines. As you all probably know, Dr. Kizzy Corbett is right here from North Carolina. She helped to discover Moderna. Um, and so we are involved in this process, whereas in the past we were not allowed to be. Um, and so I, you know, am reassured by the fact that I can text Dr. Kizzy, and I can talk to my other black female colleagues in research and ask them directly, hey, what's happening? How do you feel about this? How do you feel about the vaccine? Where are your concerns? And, and you know, we know information. So that's a huge difference between now and what has happened to us in the past. The other good thing that we have now versus before is that we have a lot of other, we have opportunities to talk to people that look like us about it, right? So early on, you know, you know, thank God for Candace being in medical school now. She's going to be one of our, you know, the next, Yay. right? We have many more of us on the side that can help to advocate for our people. We didn't have that before. We weren't allowed at the table. So that's the other thing that makes me feel better about this situation versus in the past is that, you know, I, I'm here. We're here. We can have these conversations with a little bit more knowledge than we did before. There's so there was a the question. Facebook. Yes, yeah. someone asking about being pregnant, having the vaccine while you're pregnant. Um, yes, it, is it safe or not? Let's see. Comment mm. about getting it while pregnant. She got mine at 19 weeks. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, Miss Saunders, please tell us what your experience was. I have been encouraging my pregnant and breastfeeding people to go ahead and get it. We, um, you know, ACOG, which is the the uh, association of OBGYNs, they are still following the research, but recently it came out that yes, breastfeeding mothers, go ahead and get your shot because also you're able to give antibodies to your baby through your breast milk, which is which can be life-saving, which is wonderful. Um, I have friends and patients that are pregnant that are either, you know, still a little bit hesitant depending on how early they are in their pregnancy about getting the vaccine. I think I've seen that a lot of OBGYNs are talking to their patients about maybe waiting until a little bit later in pregnancy, but still definitely get the vaccine. Marilyn Slaughter, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, you can go ahead, go ahead. She's asking for those that took the J&J &J and didn't get the second shot, should they get one of the other shots? Good question. Um, at this point, no, because we don't know what will happen if you got J&J &J and you end up getting Pfizer and Moderna, we don't know what may occur. So I wouldn't get that. Uh, now what's happening uh, for later, you know, we're, we're having discussions about will we all need a booster shot, which looks like we will, just like with the flu shot. Another good question is, if you got one this time, can you get a different one for your booster? Um, and that's, you know, the jury's still out. But I'm, I'm curious to see what occurs. I think for those that got J&J &J this time around, I hope that they'll be able to get a different type next time, just for, for better protection. <clears throat> All right. 
Gail Jones mentions there are a number of strains and variants in other countries in the U.S. Will vaccination work for those? The answer is yes. Both Pfizer and Moderna have both pro proven that they can also cover the South African strains and the Brazilian strains. It may be a little less than at the 95 to 97 percent coverage than the original COVID-19 virus, but there is protection from the strain. There was one question that I want to go back to so it doesn't get lost in there, but uh, Tasha Barnes asked, is it true that people that have O blood type aren't as affected by the virus? I keep hearing that question. I, I'm not sure. I, I've had a number of people ask me that and have talked about, you know, what their uh, research has been on that topic. So I don't want to mislead anyone. There, There is a question, though. I, I keep hearing that a lot. I'm going to have to do more research and come back to you all about that. Have you all y'all been hearing that a lot? No, Dr. Katina, I haven't that? specifically heard anything about blood types, but that would be interesting to know. It yeah. would be positive. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Let me let me do some reading. And I'm hearing news about that. Mm -hmm. And then there was another question about how long does the vaccine last? I don't know if we have right. that information yet. Right. So studies are ongoing. I have a friend of mine who's involved in one of the vaccine studies. They check her antibodies every couple of weeks and she's at month four and still has positive antibodies. So I'm curious, I'm gonna follow her along and see what she comes up with. But we're thinking we're probably gonna need a booster shot anywhere between six to 12 months. So that gives me the thought that and they're expecting antibodies to last at least six months for now. But jury's still out, we're still watching that. What happened? What, what happened? <laughs> Somebody go away? It may be my computer. You're still with us, Ms. Deborah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Somebody asked me, do you think, and I and I was I was taken back by the question because I didn't even ever think about this, but somebody asked, would the vaccine ever cost? And I was under the assumption that it would not. I would imagine. they asked, I would. Yeah. yeah. You know, I get the flu shot every year and it doesn't cost me. And you get it free at all the pharmacies every year. So I assume that this will be the same for the COVID-19 shot. So I don't, I, I don't think that they'll end up charging for it. Okay. But we'll see. Um, I think there was a chat question about your thoughts as it relates to vaccines and individuals suffering from mental health disparities. Okay. In terms of, you know, is, is it safe? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Is it safe for folks with mental health issues? Yes. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I've not seen any, um, you know, I I have seen the evidence of COVID-19, the infection causing potential long-term mental health issues like depression and anxiety. So I would definitely want you to get the vaccine to protect you from, you know, catching COVID and having a worsening of your mental health history. So get the shot, definitely. That So having a mental health history does not, uh, negate the the need for you to get the shot. And does the would, for um, those that may be watching that may have mental health disparities and may be taking medications, is there any research on how the vaccine would react with those medications, or is that something they would talk to their primary care doctor about? I guess you definitely should you know have the, the conversation with your um, primary care or your mental health provider. But I've had a number of my patients get the vaccine, and some of them. Um, definitely are on medications for uh, depression and anxiety and other issues, and it didn't cause any problems for my population. So um, definitely have the conversation with your doctors, but I don't think in general that should not prevent you from getting the vaccine. Green Trey asked, many folks think that if they have had the virus that they don't need the vaccine. Can you speak to this? That is false. If you've had the virus, you absolutely need the vaccine because you can get it again, or you can get a different strain the next time. Um, so you can still get the virus, even if you've had it one, two, three times. You get it multiple times. The other uh, answer I'll, I'll put out there is for long haulers. So I don't know if you've heard the term long haulers yet, but if you had COVID-19, you had a really bad case of it, you're recovering, but you still have some of the residual symptoms, there is benefit or there's evidence now that getting the vaccine actually can help you feel better. Um, so even more reason for those who have had the virus to get the vaccine to protect them and their family.
from catching it again. Uh, the young lady that says she got her vaccine at 19 weeks pregnancy says, I'm still here and I'm at 37 weeks. So that means she did all right. <laughs> Good. Uh, being in healthcare and exposure risk plus risk of black maternal morbidity, I felt that risk outweighed the benefit, chose to wait for the second semester. So that's her. So she waited for the second semester after 19 weeks to get the vaccine and she did, she did fine. Good. And hopefully your baby got some, uh, antibodies. That's the next question. That's the next question, which would be great. See, we have about five minutes left before it, if anybody else has any more questions. And then, of course, if you have more questions after, you can email um, the med team and um, that will be up um, for you to see. But it's now med team at nowchurchnc.com. And so you can have further questions sent there and we will get back to you with answers. Now, I have a question. A lot of people say after you get the vaccine, you cannot pass it on, that you can get COVID, but you can't pass it to nobody else. Is that true? Mm -mm. <laughs> it's, much, it's, it's much less likely that number one, you'll get it and then be able to pass it on. But there's still that small percentage, probably close to 1% chance that you could catch it, you'll find, but then give it to an unvaccinated or a immunocompromised person. So that's kind of part of the explanation I have for continuing to wear my mask. Uh -huh. Even though I'm vaccinated, my children are not. So uh -huh. I'm going to protect myself from catching it and passing it on to vulnerable patients. Okay. And I think that kind of gets to this question here about adults that have been vaccinated. Now a rule, you don't have to wear your mask. How does it impact our kids who aren't vaccinated? So that's that, that's it. I'm continuing to wear my mask for their sake. And just one last question about um, the vaccine and um, COVID testing. So I know that, you know, initially before the vaccine was approved and without a lot of people were getting tested every week or every couple of weeks, depending on their career or whatever have you. Um, what would you say to those vaccinated individuals like all of us on the call as it pertains to continually testing for COVID since you've already mentioned that we can pass it on, we may not have symptoms. Do you have a recommendation as far as how often we should get tested? It should it be every week still? Should it be a couple times a week? Do you have any feedback about that as we get ready to wrap up? Yeah. So I haven't seen any in a, any official recommendations in it, but I'll tell you what what I've been doing. I am one of those people that was testing myself pretty much every week in clinic, but uh, just to make sure um, that I didn't catch it and was asymptomatic and all that. Now that I've been vaccinated, I'm still testing, but it's a lot less, a lot less frequently. So instead of every week, it's every two to three weeks. Or if we've gone somewhere, you know, we have traveled since being fully vaccinated. So when I come back. Um, I usually will test. Um, so, I, you know, there's no official recommendation, I don't think, but what I felt comfortable with is testing, but maybe not as frequently. And then definitely testing if I think I've been exposed. Thank you. Thanks. Any last questions before we wrap up this evening? Thank you all again for joining and, and being with us and and, and hopefully you got some questions answered. I don't think I see any more. Well, Dr. Swanner, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you for spreading some knowledge and being with us. Um, continue doing your good work um, and being fabulous as you are. Um, and thank you everyone that took their time this evening to watch and hopefully like i said you have been informed and you hear it like she said from the horse's mouth and um spread the word to people you know who still would love some information and you know at the end of the day it's your decision to make and so you have to you respect your decision we respect your decision of course you have to do what's best for you and your family but hopefully that means getting vaccinated um anyone else have any closing remarks before we head off 
Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate you. Get your shot, folks. Of course. Well, thank you all again, and I hope everyone has a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.